we've allowed the cancer of relativism to infect us, so we think there are no shared universal values, and there is no freedom without those shared universals. Vrijheid is iets wat je niet kan waarderen wanneer je het helemaal hebt. Je moet het een tijdje niet hebben en dan pas begrijp je wat je mist. Reverse question. Can art destroy the world? And I think it can. You can choose either to be abused or not. The political news is robust. The safety of journalists. We hacked into the audience and then all of a sudden 300 phones would ring, you know. and welcome, a special welcome to Sonar Kagapche and Gulsha Erchitin. We're very happy that you're here. My name is Katin Kabir. I'll be your moderator this evening, an evening about a country in crisis and its president. How did Turkey get from being a promising democracy to where it is today? And where is it today? Is it still a democracy? And how can Erdogan's role be explained? What kind of man is he? And what will he have in store for Turkey? That's the kind of questions we are going to try to answer this evening with a big help of Soner Kagapçe. He is an American Turkish uh, political scientist, one of the leading experts worldwide, uh, worldwide uh, on this subject. Uh, he's the director of the Turkish research program at the Washington Institute, wrote extensively about Turkish policy, and his latest book is The New Sultan, Erdogan and the Crisis of Modern Turkey. He's going to uh, give a talk about his book. Afterwards, I will interview him. There will be room for your questions, of course. Uh, then we will be joined by uh, Gulsha. Erchitin, she's a journalist, she works at the NOS at the Foreign Desk, specialized in Turkish affairs as well. We will talk about the Turkish current situation and about the future. And then there will be more uh, room for your questions and remarks. This evening will, as always, be scre uh, streamed. There's a live stream and you can watch it afterwards online. Well, let's give a warm Warm welcome to Sonar Kagache. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Katinka. I just want to make sure you can all hear me in the back. Good? Oh, excellent. Great. So, a uh, real pleasure to be here uh, this evening. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about my book, uh, The New Sultan Erdogan and the Crisis of Modern Turkey. I also brought a copy. Uh, I like my book a lot, so I'm taking it around with me um, so I could show it to you. Uh, it's a book that I wrote in the last year. Uh, of course, it's, it looks at Turkey's current and ongoing uh, crisis. What I thought I would do this evening is speak to you for about 20 minutes or so on the current political issues facing Turkey. And then, of course, in the Q&A, I hope that uh, both Katinka and Gülşah will help me uh, drill further into the book and its themes. If you follow my work, uh, if you follow our work at the Washington Institute for Nearest Policy, where I'm based in the U.S., uh, this book kind of traces some of my earlier scholarship on Turkey. Uh, I have a previous book that I wrote four years ago. It's called The Rise of Turkey, uh, the 21st Century's First Muslim Power. In that book, I had looked at Turkey's dramatic economic transformation under Erdogan. I wanted to write about it because I saw it happen. Uh, Erdogan came to power in 2002 with his Justice and Development Party. He's been running Turkey for now 15 years. For nearly a decade, uh, this was a, considered a success story because economically Turkey was doing so well. And I wrote about that success story, about its transformation, how Erdogan uh, took a country that was mostly of poor people and turned it into a country of mostly middle-income people. Turkey went from uh, being uh, obviously a country uh, with quite low human development um, index indicators. Uh, when Erdogan came to power, the factoid I like most from my previous book is that infant mortality rate in Turkey was, uh, in 2002, when he came to power, comparable to pre-war Syria. That is pre-war Syria. Now it is comparable to Spain. So 
Obviously, things have improved in Turkey, and that's probably, I would say, the reason why he wins is primarily because of the economic growth. But I took this one step further, and I said, Erdogan has transformed Turkey. It has become a middle-income economy. Now he can make it an advanced economy. I said, the road to that goes through writing a new constitution, liberal democratic order, which would give Turkeys to disparate halves, for the lack of a better word, the two halves that are considered religious and secular, uh, what they want. Uh, the religious half would get freedom of religion, and the secular half would get freedom from religion, both in the same constitution. So if that constitution can provide it at the same time, a society that guarantees freedom of religion and freedom from religion, so the same constitution would provide broad individual liberties for everybody, including the Kurds. So with the broader rights for the Kurds, Turkey would solve its Kurdish problem at home, stop fighting the Kurds in the Middle East, and then it would release its energy and become a sore and become a um, rising power. I don't think Erdogan read my book, so I decided to, to write this one, which where I argue now Turkey is in a crisis. So why is it in a crisis? It is uh, largely, I think, driven by his political trajectory. So the economic story is the bright side of Erdogan's legacy. He's done very well. He's transformed Turkey economically. But the political side is not so bright. Uh, and that's because Erdogan, in my view, is the prototype of right-wing populist leaders that we see a lot now globally. Uh, what he has done is, in addition to, of course, delivering growth to get elected, he's also demonized, uh, brutalized, and cracked down on demographics that are not likely to vote for him, starting with secularists, then extending into other groups in society, from liberals to leftists to social democrats, Kurdish nationalists, and to Alevis. Alevis are liberal Muslims. They would be the Unitarian Universalists of Islam in comparison to Christianity. Uh, so when you add these groups up, of course, uh, you get a large part of Turkey. All these groups I went through, they make up nearly half of Turkish society. And that is Turkey's crisis, uh, because there is half of Turkey which adores Erdogan, mostly conservative, uh, many of whom have been lifted out of poverty by him, so they're grateful to him. Uh, but there's also another half, uh, not as homogenous as the pro-Erdogan half, the, composed of disparate groups of seculars, Turkish and Kurdish nationalists, conservatives, center-right and center-left, and Alevis and liberals and others, who uh, oppose him but also loathe him. And I think that's because they have seen uh, Turkey change under his uh, regime. One of the things I highlight in the new sultan is that uh, I say that Erdogan is sort of like the new Ataturk, Ataturk in quotes. I'm glad it's a small room and you can see my fingers. Uh, what's an Ataturk in quotes? So what did Ataturk do? He established Turkey after World War I out of the ashes of the Ottoman Empire, and then he modernized it in his own image, right? Uh, he said that Turkey will be secular, Western, European, because this is who I am. So it was a Jacobin, top-down model of social engineering. That's the Ataturk model. Erdogan is a new Ataturk in quote because, of course, he doesn't share Ataturk's values. He's the opposite in terms of values. He wants Turkey to be not secular Western European, but conservative, politically Islamist, and directionally Middle Eastern. But his methods are Ataturk's methods, just as Ataturk used social policy, education, state resources to shape Turks in his own image. Erdogan is doing the same. He's using state resources, social policy, and education to shape Turkey in his own image. But the problem is, Ataturk was a general. He did not have a democratic mandate. He had wide legitimacy as Turkey's liberator, reformer, and founder. Uh, his country was 11% uh, liter literate. Most educated Turks supported Ataturk. Erdogan's Turkey is 97% literate. Most educated Turks don't support him. He has a democratic mandate. Only half of the country agrees with his vision. The other half does not agree with it. And that is Turkey's crisis. To go forward, act as the new Ataturk or the anti-Ataturk Ataturk, right? Because he shape, takes Ataturk's methods but not values. Erdogan can only do this by eroding democracy and ending it. Because for him to continue democratically, that doesn't seem to be likely. And I think that's what I really wanted to write about. I started writing this book, uh, just to give you a little background, uh, last year before the coup attempt in Turkey. My publisher and I had agreed that I would write this uh, over the course of a year. It would be edited this past summer and published now. 
And then the coup plot happened and the publisher asked me if I could speed it up, so I like to write, which is fine. Uh, so I wrote it uh, between August last year after I came back from the beach vacation and uh, Christmas Eve, that was my deadline. I submitted it, it was uh, edited, copy edited, designed, typeset and printed between Christmas and April this year. I felt very lucky because the book was published uh, the week of the referendum in Turkey, uh, which Erdogan won, and I wanted to send Erdogan a thank you note to say uh, thank you Mr. Erdogan for timing the launch of my book, uh, the referendum with the timing of uh, the launch of my book. So. Uh, I think it worked uh, uh, significantly, but the country's crisis, of course, has not really been resolved. I think it's quite a deep crisis going forward. I said because it's a very divided society, uh, and in, in a democratic divided society, the time, I believe, and I write in the New Sultan, that the time for Ataturk model has passed in Turkey or anywhere. You cannot shape societies like that top down. It worked 120 years ago when the society was only 10% literate and most educated people supported you. That's not any more feasible, but that's not how he sees it. So he wants to continue uh, trying to shape Turkey in his own image. It's going to be hard for him. Let me just show you some facts here. So this is a map of Turkey showing the referendum outcome. As you know, Turkey has 81 provinces. Uh, they're shaded uh, in two colors. Yes is in green, and no is in uh, gray. Uh, or. Um, uh, silver, uh, and you are seeing that the country is geographically almost equally split, and the ballot results are on the right. 51% said yes, 48, almost 49% said no. But what is more significant is that the provinces that said no to Erdogan, this is a referendum which gave him uh, many executive powers, right? After the referendum, he is now head of state, head of government, uh, head of uh, ruling party, I just have to show you the book, he's the new sultan, right? Because he's made, become the most powerful person. But ironically, uh, only half of the country agrees to this, the other half does not. And the provinces that voted against him together represent 73% of Turkey's GDP, including its three big cities, Istanbul, Ankara, and Izmir. Istanbul is especially important because this is where Erdogan started his political career. He became a nationwide name in 1994 when he became Istanbul's mayor. This is what catapulted him to national stardom. So uh, Turkey's economic future is not voting for him. He knows that. There's one more interesting chart. This shows you demographics breakdown of support for or against Erdogan in the referendum. So he won the referendum 51 to 49, but he lost it in one age group only people who are between 18 and 32. He lost it by 47 to 53, you know, 52 to 48, right? By four points. What is that significant? If you are 18 to 30 year, 32 years old in Turkey now, you were three to 18 years old when Erdogan came to power. So you were raised in his country, in his uh, Turkey, which is ironic. The people who are raised under him are the people who are likely, least likely to favor him. So which means going into the future, he's going to have a demographic problem. The, the youth that he's raising is, with his new vision of the Erdogan values in the Ataturk model is the part of the country that is most likely to say no to him going forward. And he sees that too. And that's his challenge, which is why I think going forward, of course, Erdogan will um, try to make sure uh, that the election field is not level and uh, uh, the, the playing field, that is, is not level. Uh, there were already, the OEC report stated that the elections, uh, the referendum, at this time, of course, the campaign was not uh, uh, fair, although the vote itself was largely free. And that will be a first in Turkey. It will be very sad, it breaks my heart. I'm, I've studied Turkey for nearly 25 years. I, I love studying and writing about it and speaking about it, but it's a sad fact because Turkey has had free and fair elections longer than has had Spain. Uh, Spain started in the 1970s, Turkey started in 1950, and it will be the first time elections will be rigged or unfair if that happens. So my fear is that going forward, Erdogan sees this demographics. He also sees that the country's economic future is not voting for him. So he's going to uh, take steps to end democracy or erode democratic institutions as he has been doing. He's used the powers given to him by the coup or in the post-coup environment, not to crack down only on coup plotters, but also to crack down on this 50% that opposes him. And that is, I think that the post-coup environment has actually exacerbated Turkey's crisis 
has not made it any better. And throw into this, of course, uh, countries' adversaries. Um, I'm happy to look at this in the Q&A. Uh, Turkey has a number of uh, neighbors. Um, but uh, the foreign policy that Erdogan has uh, followed in the last 15 years, uh, which I highlight in my book, um, has largely been a failure, unfortunately. This policy was about to make uh, the idea, if you guys remember, you read the news, uh, the main uh, theme of the foreign policy was that Turkey would have zero problems with neighbors. Now Turkey has zero neighbors with problems. It's the complete opposite. This is the first. Uh, it's four major non-European neighbors. Russia, Iran, Iraq, and Syria are for the first time united in an alliance against Turkey in modern history. That has never happened before. Not even in the Cold War, not even in the 30s, not even in the last decade. They have intelligence fusion cells in Baghdad. Uh, of course, uh, Russians are part of this effort because Erdogan has tried to oust Assad regime that's supported by Russia and Iran. Erdogan has pushed uh, uh, with the Kurds in Iraq against central government, again upsetting Iran and Iraq. And that is, of course, exposes Turkey to four of its non-European neighbors who are united in a hostile anti-Turkish alliance. Russia is especially significant because uh, uh, I think Putin, for a number of reasons, wants to see a weak Turkey. A weak Turkey means a weak NATO, right? It's an important ally. And a weak Turkey means a Turkey that's in crisis, where you got 50 percent versus 50 percent, and the country's energy is consumed by that crisis. So he's going to be a player going forward in, in uh, boosting up both sides so to make sure that neither side wins and both sides keep each other on their toes. That, of course, leaves us with many challenges. I don't want to leave you before I conclude. I've delivered so many bad news. I do want to deliver one piece of good news. Uh, so I gave you uh, three trajectories. I said uh, Turkey is in crisis. That's one. Second, I said Erdogan uh, is taking and will take steps to end democracy. And third, I said this is not very good news because then the country's democratic institutions being weakened, you got deep societal polarization that will lead into an even uh, deeper crisis. There's a fourth trajectory uh, beyond uh, you know, crisis and democracy, deeper crisis. And the fourth one, I call it uh, thanks to Erdogan, but despite Erdogan trajectory. And what do I mean by that? So remember in the beginning, I told you about my other book about how he made Turkey very wealthy. And, uh, and of course, he's uh, built a big power base uh, because of that. He has lifted many people out of poverty. He has actually increased incomes in Turkey. And this is something on which he deserves credit. Um, if, it's so easy right now to hear analysis on Turkey where uh, people will, if you ask people to compare pre-Erdogan years to now, they will either say Turkey was heaven and he made it hell, or that it was hell and he made it heaven. The reality is neither. I think in some ways it has improved economically. Uh, politically it has not. But the economic improvement also means that it has now a large middle class base. Uh, much bigger than before. We saw this in 2013 uh, Gezi Park rallies. These were rallies uh, which took place in 79 of these 81 provinces. They was, sustained themselves for two months. Uh, two and a half million people participated in them. He spread the wealth enough that you now have a middle class base across Anatolia, which didn't used to be the case in Turkey, where you had middle class in big cities, but not in the small towns in the interior. And I think there's enough energy uh, in this anti-Erdogan bloc of Turkey, which is middle class base, to actually make a case for a liberal Turkey. I'm not holding my breath on that because half of Turkey that supports Erdogan has their natural charismatic leader, it's Erdogan. The other half of Turkey that doesn't support him do not have a natural charismatic leader. So until I see that leader, charismatic, I call it the new Ataturk, right? who can unite the country in their own image and be uh, charismatic enough to have people follow them. Until I see that person, he or she, rising, uh, of course, I think the case for a liberal Turkey is more long term, uh, which will be the topic of my next book. Uh, I hope to write it, called The Case for a Liberal Turkey. Maybe I'll come back again to speak to you at uh, the belly at that time. And thank you again for your attention. I appreciate it, of course. The title of your book, you told me that you were not in favor of the title when it was first. Correct. It was not your idea, right? Right. Tell so, us. So um, basically, can you hear me again? Great. 
basically, uh, uh, those of you who write know that when you write, uh, you can negotiate with the editors on every word in your article or book, except for the title. The title always belongs to the editors because it has to fit into the bigger picture of the publication for that day, or whatever they think is more marketable and more sexy or more jazzy. So I have, uh, so far, I can tell you, I have written, um, my assistants recently uh, refurbished my website, so they told me I had written about 500 op-eds in the last 15 years. There's only one op-ed, which is an opinion editorial, like a column you write in a newspaper. Only one that I wrote, whose title I kept. Uh, I'm going to tell you the story because it's a good You're not very one. good in, in titles, are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> it's called, um, the title is called, I Want My Caliph Back. Um, and a lot of my friends on Facebook dropped me when I wrote this. They said, what, you want the caliphate back? Are you jihadist? I said, read the article, <laughs> not the title. So it was about, <laughs> it was about the last Ottoman caliph, who, who means the last male of the Ottoman family born in Istanbul. I went to meet him before he died in 2008 in New York City. He lived in New York City. Uh, he was uh, married to a South African Jew. He listened to Wagner and drank scotch. I said, I want this caliph back, <laughs> of course. That was the article's title, and they kept it, uh, so I was very grateful. But most oftentimes, I'm not allowed to keep the title, and when I wrote the book, uh, the publishers asked me, they said, let's use the new Sultan title. I said, I don't like it, it's very patronizing, it's Orientalist. I said, first of all, in English, you should be a king, not a Sultan, because that's Orientalist. I said, and secondly, I don't think, this is two years ago, I said, Sultan is an exaggeration, and uh, when the book was published, of course, the week of the referendum, when Erdogan did become the sultan, becoming head of state, head of government, head of ruling party, head of everything, I felt that I had done a good job by listening to my uh, publishers, so I'm grateful, yeah. You mentioned you, you, that you didn't think that Erdogan read your last book. There's no way to know, but do you, you know this man, I mean, you, you... I met him, right. You met him, you, you know everything about him. Do you think he, he has read this book? Do you think he would be interested in a leading expert who writes a book about him. Yeah, I was joking when I said I don't think he read my first he book did. because he didn't he follow did. my prescriptions there. I think I, he did read ah, it. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, he yeah. did. My prescription was to become a liberal democracy because I do believe that Erdogan wants to make Turkey a great power. I think he's genuine, he's sincere. I just don't think he's executing the right policies to get there, including uh, many failures in foreign policy. I think uh, that my work gets translated into Turkish. I write mostly in English and I think that it's read and reported to him. So. I'm just waiting to see his reaction to it when the, when the final report gets to him, of course. The book was released uh, only recently in the English language, and it takes a while to translate it into Turkish. But it will be tr uh, published in Turkey as well? I, I hope so, yeah. So far, it's, it's on sale in Turkey as well as anywhere you can have, you can, anywhere there's Amazon, you can buy it, basically. Uh, and that also accounts for Turkey. So far, I have requests for it to be translated into German. Italian, uh, Croatia, so it's getting close to Turkey. Uh, yeah. <laughs> As you said, you met him, when was this? And I met him a number of times in Washington when he came, uh, at various meetings, I visited the US uh, quite a few times. Uh, and I think he's an extremely charismatic person. Uh, uh, the, and the comparison I would make in the US is Bill Clinton. People always say Bill Clinton is very charismatic. If you see him, you just want to vote for him. When I listen to Erdogan, I do want to vote for him um, because he's incredibly charismatic. Mm -hmm. he, yeah. he will suck the air out of, out of the room when he enters the room and he's extremely, extremely um, talented. So I think uh, people who are good politicians are like people who are born with a talent uh, to paint and then whose parents send them to get painting classes. Erdogan has both. He was born with a talent, natural, and then he got his painting classes when he ran Istanbul from the Welfare Party. He learned politics, grassroots, bottoms up. He didn't enter politics as a minister or a prime minister. He was a district uh, party branch leader for the Welfare Party, the Islamist movement. He became Istanbul head for the same party, and then he became its mayor, and then he became prime minister. So he's really someone who's not only born with a talent for politics, but also got lessons uh, breaking his teeth in politics for nearly 20 years. I think he's, he's one of the best politicians around in terms of the ability to win elections and to turn even the odds against him. Yeah. You described what you, what you thought or felt when you saw the coup happening. Can you tell us? I did. So uh, I, I was just saying that I studied Turkey for nearly 25 years. I, I love writing on Turkey. I love analyzing Turkey. and uh, It's probably my, it's my biggest passion. Uh, 
next to yoga. I also like yoga. Um, <laughs> Tell us so, all about it right. another time. So my second biggest passion, writing on Turkey and reading about it. Uh, the Night of the Coup, uh, uh, this was for us, uh, obviously, or I'm in Washington, so I'm seven hours behind. Uh, I was commissioned by uh, two papers to write op-eds for the next day, uh, one with Wall Street Journal and one with Washington Post. And it was the, the first time in my life I did not like studying Turkey. I saw pictures of Ankara getting bombed and people getting killed and uh, bloodshed, and I said, that's not the country I'm used to studying and analyzing. It broke my heart, and I really did not enjoy it. I wrote those pieces, and I felt very bad about everything that I was, of course, writing and analyzing, because I felt that the coup will change, uh, would change Turkey irreversibly, and it will never be uh, like the country before the coup. It will be broken in so many ways, and unfortunately, uh, a year yeah. later, that seems to be the case. I think it's really going to be hard to go back to the pre-coup Turkey uh, for a variety of reasons. And up until then, you were optimistic about Turkey. I was. So yeah. one of the reasons I think I've become more of a pessimist on uh, Turkey, I still, though I still have the fourth trajectory, so you see that I'm a clinical optimist. Uh, I never give up. The, uh, the Erdogan, uh, despite Erdogan, but thanks to Erdogan, liberal trajectory, it's there. Yeah. Yeah. But the more short-term trajectories, I think, are all quite uh, negative and pessimistic. And one reason, I think, if the coup, if the generals had succeeded, Turkey would have become authoritarian. If Erdogan succeeded, it still became authoritarian. So that's why I argued uh, in a piece I think I did for the Washington Post after the coup that there was no good outcome for Turkey, and either way it was going to be <clears throat> much less liberal and much less free, and I, that seems to be the case, unfortunately. You also said once, I think in an interview, that it was a very untypical coup, right? It was not the, <clears throat> the way uh, Turkish coup Completely. So I, I said, um, of course, nobody expected this to happen. Uh, one of the reasons I think it was completely um, analytically unpredictable was because it was not a Turkish coup, in quotes, right? What is a Turkish coup? Uh, there are three elements of a Turkish coup. First of all, it's bloodless. Second, the whole military participates in it. Third, it's hierarchical. It runs in the military from top down. This coup was neither of these things. It was bloody. It was factional. Only part of the military took part in it. In fact, part of the military attacked not just Erdogan, but the other parts of the military. And thirdly, of course, it was not hierarchical, which is why I think it broke down because uh, it's like a car that loses one wheel. And because it's not hierarchical, when you lose the wheel, you don't know how to put up the next wheel because not everybody's in the effort together. And I think that's why it unraveled quite yeah. fast. And, and even the timing was bad. Yes, completely. So uh, the coup was apparently supposed to be rolled out at 3 AM, uh, which is the, if you're plotting a coup, that's probably the best time to do it because everybody's in bed. Uh, yet the coup was unrolled, uh, unraveled at 10 PM. Uh, have you ever been to Istanbul in the summer on, at 10 p.m.? Remember I talked to you about how Turkey has two disparate halves, so uh, 10 p.m. in August, half of the country, which is anti-Erdogan, is out drinking and partying, and the other half of the country is coming from evening prayers, which is the last prayer of the day for Muslims, so everybody was out on the streets. If there was one time the coup would have failed, it was 10 p.m., and I think the, so like the plotters, basic rules of how to plan a coup, the they coup like plotters, all ignored it. The coup plotters ignored it, and I think that's because they realized that they were discovered, that they were going to lose it anyway, they were going to be jailed. They said, let's take a risk, maybe it will work. But that assumed that everything was going to work perfectly, because it's a factional business and they can't talk to each other freely. So I think once something went wrong, all the tires of the car came off and the whole plot unraveled uh, pretty fast. Yeah. There was not going to be any good outcome, you just said. Was it like the best thing that could happen for Ed Erdogan? In, in a way, end? yes. And he did say this. He said this is like a blessing from God as the coup was unraveling. And some people have said, oh, Erdogan must have known about the coup. That's not possible. Nobody's that good. Uh, I don't think you can orchestrate anything like that. Uh, but he did use uh, the post-coup environment. So when I, in the original uh, draft of the book, uh, The New Sultan, I wrote, uh, maybe because I wanted to see it, I said Erdogan can be a unifier after the coup. And for a while, it looked like he was going to be a unifier. There was a big rally uh, after the coup in which all four parties represented in the parliament participated. Um, it was not partisan. And it looked like the country was unifying. And maybe this whole. Um, because they were against Erdogan, but more 
but they they, they were more for democracy, for democracy right. right i think that was the nice uh, if there was one nice takeaway of the coup it was that everybody in turkey wants democracy that's good uh, nobody wants military rule even if it means this is how you eliminate your uh, enemies and opponents uh, and i thought that maybe erdogan would take this and stop being less divisive and more of a unifier and reach out to constituencies that he has brutalized and from leftists uh, to Alevis to seculars to social democrats uh, it, it maybe for a while he did that and i think he went back to becoming a, a divisive figure and to me what has exacerbated turkey's crisis is that after the coup uh, he has used the post-coup powers to go after his opponents in a more fierce manner than before i think erdogan's main um, uh, his success, one of the reasons why he was so successful is that he's a gradualist. He, um, I can use this analogy here, I can never use it in the state. So, you know, you've seen a doner kebab being sliced, right? Because in the US people won't understand it. They don't have it. Right? They don't, they don't have, have it. it. So Erdogan sliced Turkey's democracy like slicing doner yeah. kebab. Yeah. Very thin slices. Yeah. So if you don't watch it, you don't see how it's getting small because you're only seeing one slice getting off. But it's, saying, oh, it's pretty big, big cuts, now right? Now it's big cuts. Okay. That was until the coup. Until right. the coup, the slices were very thin. You couldn't see them because you were only looking at the piece that came off. You were not looking at the big picture and how small it was getting. Since the coup, he's taking big slices off. So I think his gradualism disappeared with the coup. He doesn't care now, and he just wants to kind of really consolidate power. But how faster. can he get away with it if everyone wants democracy and he, you know, he's so I, attacking I, democracy? Ironically, I think uh, in Turkey, if you talk to an Erdogan supporter, Turkey is a democracy, and it is. Because for the pro-Erdogan camp, they have complete freedoms and liberties. They live in a democratic environment. If you're in the anti-Erdogan camp, you don't live in a democracy. What is sad is that they're now, they now live in two different worlds, and they can't relate to each other's dilemmas. So if you support Erdogan, you don't understand that the other 50% uh, lacks rights and freedoms, and they are suffering. You don't empathize, and I think maybe it's a divergence in these two different worlds that's really hard to bring together uh, with or without Erdogan in Turkey that people are seeing two different realities for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, recently there was You asked really good questions, by the oh, way. Oh, well, yeah. thank you. <laughs> you give good uh, answers thank as you. well. We agreed on this before. This is just, yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah. <laughs> we will compliment you as well later on. Uh, recently, we had two uh, other Erdogan biographers, French uh, biographers, Jean-Francois Perrouz and Nicolas Cheviron, and they argued that Erdogan never had a master plan, that he just like, yeah, mm. made use of the situation, that's why he's where he is now. Do you agree? So, um, I don't live in Erdogan's mind. I can't say this was his master plan. One of the issues I grappled with in my book was to look at whether there are inflection points along the road which made Erdogan make the decisions that he picked that has brought Turkey here. And I argue uh, that there are a number of inflection points. So inflection points means he's at a crossroads. He can go A or B. He goes B. Why did he go B and not A? And there are two main inflection points. One is uh, EU accession, I think is an inflection point. And the other is this uh, threshold in the Turkish political system. EU accession. Uh, uh, Turkey started accession talks in 2005. It qualified in 2004. It took Turkey nearly a year to open accession talks. Uh, I, I was told by people in the room that uh, the night the talks actually started, Erdogan left the room with a bitter taste, realizing that this wasn't going to be accession talks of any country. It was going to be full of hurdles, uh, made specially difficult for Turkey. I think he's not completely... Uh, uh, unjustified uh, accession talks with other countries previously were one round of talks that began and ended with Turkey and also with Croatia, which came with Turkey. They were split into 35 chapters. Uh, now you have opening and closing benchmarks for each chapter, and you need unanimous consent of all members. So 28 members, 35 chapters to open and to close. That's 872 vetoes for Turkey. So I think he realized that this was not going to be accession talks for Estonia. It will be for Turkey, and maybe this was politically charged. So maybe from the beginning, the process, I think, left him with a, a, a bad aftertaste. Mm -hmm. But it takes two to tango. I think Erdogan was also, in my view, utilitarian mm -hmm. on the way he saw EU accession talks. Because the biggest fear for Islamists in Turkey in the 80s and 90s was the military, the secular military, which saw itself as the grand 
arbiter of Turkish politics. It was an undemocratic check and balance, right? Yeah. If an Islamist party came to power, they would push it out. Uh, most recently in 1997 in what is called a soft coup. It is called a soft coup because there was never a coup. The military rolled a column of tanks on, on, into Ankara uh, when an Isla a coalition government was formed in which there was an Islamist party. And this warning was enough. The Islamist party stepped down. Um, I think the lesson that Erdogan took from this was when he came to power, he would be systematic about isolating the military and eliminating its power. And EU accession provided them with the perfect tool for that. Because European Union said that to enter the, uh, into the club, Turkey needs to have rule of law, which means no military in politics. So he was not going after the military because it's an Islamist. He was going after it to take Turkey into the EU. But uh, once he took the military out of politics uh, through a various uh, number of mechanisms, that's where the inflection point came. I think had EU been sincere about the accession process at that point, it would have and could have become Turkey's next grand arbiter. But I think the EU was never willing to play that role uh, because once Erdogan eliminated the military, the EU said, oh, now you can do whatever you want at home. And I think that's when the EU lost whatever power it had. So I think in the way Erdogan used the EU accession process and the EU failed to use its soft power in Turkey last decade, not this decade, now it's too late to warn Erdogan on democratic transgressions. He's consolidated power. But before he consolidated power, EU had leverage to warn him about these transgressions. And that's when membership was more meaningful because Erdogan was attracting record amount of foreign direct investment. And the investment was coming to Turkey because accession talks seemed more realistic than they are today. And so I think the EU had really more leverage to threaten suspension of talks in the last decade when it would have really hurt Erdogan's uh, trajectory than in this decade when it's really not FDI, foreign direct investment, that comes in that drives growth. It's mega projects funded by the government that drive growth. So that's one uh, inflection point. The other is the uh, threshold. It's, it's nerdy. I can explain. Basically, Turkey has an, uh, system, a rule that parties that have less than 10% of the vote nationally cannot be represented in the parliament. It's one of the highest thresholds in any democracy. This threshold has always cut out middle-sized parties from the parliament. So if a party gets 8 9%, it cannot get in. And the way it works is the, the votes, the seats they'll be getting in the legislature goes usually to the first party, which is AKP. So from the beginning, Erdogan's party, which he said was a moderate force, was endowed with an unrepresentative parliamentary majority. In 2002, he got 36% of the vote. He had 66% of the seats in the parliament. That's not representative, right? So he's not, he doesn't feel that he should be moderate or build consensus because he has more seats in the parliament than he deserves. And I think uh, every election since 2002, so let me put it this way, in none of the elections so far, Erdogan's AKP has received more than 50% of the vote. But in every parliament, he had more than 50% of the seats. I think the threshold is actually a curse, not a blessing, because it eliminated the reason for his moderation. Yeah. If, it had been rep if, his, uh, if his power in the parliament had been representative, uh, commensurate with his share in the votes, it would have forced him to be more um, consensus builder, listen to others, instead of becoming a demonizing politician. So because I argue in the yeah. book that it's, it looks like a blessing to him, but it's actually a curse, because it, it makes Erdogan make that decision. He doesn't go to A, he goes to B. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about his personality. You write that even though he's like uh, the, the strongest leader since Ataturk, he feels like an outsider. He does. Uh, so the book really gave me an appreciation for Erdogan's life because I had to do some research on um, you know, his upbringing, his political career. He was born uh, in 1954 uh, in a working class neighborhood of Istanbul called Kasım Pasha, which is where the uh, shipyards are since the Ottoman times. Uh, at the time, he was uh, not only born into a poor uh, family, but also a pious and conservative family. And of course, uh, this is when uh, Turkey was a much poorer country uh, compared to what it is now. So he's growing up in a society where there's already a, an issue of class for him. He's growing up poor um, uh, compared to uh, the wealth that he sees across. And Kasım Pasha is in a very interesting place. It's literally 10 minutes from the city's uh, most wealthy neighborhoods. Uh, kind of, you can see the contrast in wealth and poverty uh, in about 10 minutes uh, walking. 
So he has that, but there's a bigger element. He was raised in uh, secularist Turkey, very different than today, at which time, uh, like the French system of laicite, which Ataturk put in place, um, I love this conversation because I don't have to explain what laicite is, and uh, also <laughs> the doner kebab is, yeah, that's great. <laughs> so in the laicite concept, there's complete separation of religion and politics. There can be no we religion. Know, we know that, you like know? doner kebab. Uh, and as a result of that, of course, his family, I think people like him, him and his family felt profoundly marginalized because they were pious, they were religious, and they wanted to wear religion on their sleeve. They wanted to be religious all the time, everywhere, uh, entirely, and they couldn't. He went to a school called Imam Atip, which, was, uh, which is funded by taxpayers' money. It's a religious school, great. Uh, but he was told when he was graduating that he could only qualify to wash the body of the dead, which is a task that is traditionally reserved for the clergy in Islam. He had to quit his school to switch to a regular high school so he could go and study what he wanted to study. So I, I argue in the New Sultan that understanding Erdogan goes through understanding his upbringing in uh, this secularist environment in which people like him felt marginalized, at times second class, and he's now in charge. He's the most powerful leader in Turkey since Ataturk. He's the new Sultan, he's head of state, head of government, head of everything. But I argue that when he's at the top of his political career, he sometimes as a citizen, he feels weak. Because uh, for so much of his life, for 49 years, he felt marginalized. The last 17 years, he does not. But if you put 49 and 17 together, of course, there's a, there's a massive difference there. And I think it's one of the reasons why he's unable to let go easy on the opposition. He fears that the moment he lets go on the opposition, they'll push him back to Qasim Pasha, where he came from. They'll be pushed back to this position where he was discriminated against, and that's very unfortunate. I wish he would relax and realize that he is now Turkey's big boss, and he's in charge, and nobody's going to push him back, and that would be uh, a way of Turkey for moving forward, of course. One more question before we go to, to your questions. What if his father would have been more into football? <laughs> Erdogan uh, loved playing um, football as a kid. Uh, it was his big passion. He wanted to be a football player. Um, I'm saying this because I want to say soccer first. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, his father was basically said no sports. You, can, you you can't be anything serious if you play sports. And he still does play football. So if if there's a soccer stadium which is being football stadium which is being opened up, he'll go and do the first kick. Okay. Uh, he would have maybe become an entirely different person. I think maybe his potential would have been realized. But uh, what matters is that. He is, um, he's going to go down in history as one of the most consequential politicians of the early 21st century, whichever way his legacy goes, because he has singularly revolutionized Turkey. He has eliminated Ataturk's legacy, uh, the, the sec secularism or laicite. He has replaced it with his own legacy, Erdogan, or Erdoganism, as you see it. Of course, the irony of it is that uh, in Ataturk's Turkey, which was not democratic, you could not oppose him. In Erdogan's Turkey, which is democratic, you can oppose him. So he will have this permanent challenge, which is also going to grow, uh, as I show you from the charts. And it's really not an easy ride for him going forward. He has just won the referendum to become this very powerful leader. Uh, but uh, he's probably thinking every day how to handle this growing uh, constituency that is about to become Turkey's majority. And by 2019, the next time there are elections, they might be over 50%. And how he deals with that, that's going to be his challenge. Questions? Yes. This works? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. I have one question. Uh, you mentioned Erdogan bringing economic growth, but you can also say that there was a huge crisis in Turkey in 2000, 2001 where a lot of reforms were put in 2001 by Kemal Darvish. So the check was in the mail anyway. And the EU accession talks and everything afterwards, you can kind of see it as Erdogan trying to cling on to power. This was someone who was jailed in the late 90s due to his political views. He saw the postmodern coup in 1997. Uh, what, what kind of ideology do you think he has? Because I don't see him as a religious figure. He could have been the new caliph, but he's a new sultan. Uh, and all he's done so far is cling on to power. But what next? He has no successor. 
all the people in this party who actually had a vision are marginalized, including the former president. So what's, what do you think his end game is? Rather than hold on to power, I mean, there, there's a time this guy is going to die. Then what? What is Erdoganism? Right. So let me start with your first question on uh, to what extent is he the owner of this economic miracle? Uh, you're right. Uh, Turkey's recovery started before Erdogan came to power. It started under the reforms of uh, the outgoing coalition government. Uh, I can tell you, I can just give you one, uh, there are a lot of uh, you know, experts and analysts and uh, thinkers in this room. I have a great analytical tool to share with you. If you're ever writing uh, analysis on Turkish governments and Turkey's stability, uh, you can always use the following. If there is a coalition government in Turkey, it always results in economic and political crisis. If there's a single party government, it means stability. It's that simple. So Erdogan's luck is that he was preceded by a coalition government which though it carried out reforms uh, that cleaned up the economy and the banking sector and put the country's house in shape, it collapsed because coalition governments in Turkey never finish their terms. It has never happened. Uh, I've never seen an example of that. So it was this chaos that he followed that because it's a single party government, it doesn't matter what the ideology is. You can be left wing, right wing, Islamist, liberal. If it's a single party government, it survives. And I think his success was that it was like a breath of fresh air after a decade of coalition governments in the 90s where Turkey had six elections, four economic crises, uh, including its most uh, painful crisis in modern history in 2001, suddenly you have single party government, stability, no crisis, and I think that's where he deserves credit. He brought a very different change of politics, uh, with lack of uh, crisis following this uh, decade. Uh, Erdogan and where he wants to go. So I think that uh, AKP, which was established in 2001, uh, started as a broad coalition, um, a movement rather, of representing almost all colors of Turkey's political right. It had business liberal, pro-business liberals and center-right figures, right of center, conservatives and Islamists in it, six different groups. That's how it started, which is why I think Erdogan's rhetoric of moderation of Islamist work because they incorporated everybody else from the right and they were aided in this regard by the fact that in the 2001 crisis which you mentioned uh, traditional right-wing parties collapsed so their voters went to AKP which said we're not Islamists we're just a broad right-wing movement we have everybody we have uh, liberals uh, business liberals left uh, center-right people you can come join us that's how it started the more power he built uh, meaning his popularity went up the more he felt the need to keep this coalition in place, maybe again the curse of the threshold, right? Because the threshold always gives him lopsided majorities in the parliament. He gets 36% of the vote, he has 66% of the seats. He gets 46% of the vote, he has 60% of the seats. He says, why am I making alliances with these people? Why can't I uh, keep the core? And I think it went from being a movement of the political right to becoming an Islamist party dominated by the Islamist cadres of the welfare party from which Erdogan descends. You saw this in each time there were cabinets. Uh, uh, politicians who came from outside of the Islamist movement would be jettisoned and they'll be more and more dominated by people who came from the welfare party. But that's not the case anymore. Now it's become Erdogan's party. It's no more a movement or a party. It's all about him. Meaning uh, if you're an Islamist, you don't support Erdogan, that's not good. And if you're not an Islamist, you worship him, that's great. So it's really about, you know, I, I think basically whether or not you are for him or against him, that's really what it boils down to. And uh, at this stage, of course, he wants to retain power indefinitely because uh, one of the reasons why I think Turkey is in a crisis is because he has stepped on so many toes, uh, locked up so many people, and, you know, uh, um, demonized so many constituencies in the last 15 years that he feels that if he loses elections, he might be prosecuted or persecuted. So that's why he doesn't want to lose elections ever again. That's trouble for him. He has to win, uh, win, and win. That's the strategy, I think. Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Soner. Uh, of course. I have 10,002 questions, but I will ask one. Just one. Ask one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> First of all, uh, there are six uh, qualifications dictated by the Constitution of Turkey to be a candidate for the presidency, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And my question is whether Erdogan complies with those requirements dictated by the, 
the constitution of Turkey. This is number one. Second is, is uh, since Erdogan and his party have the majority in the parliament, what, what are your thoughts uh, about as to why they stopped uh, opening an investigation about the, the military coup? About the what? Military, military coup. Mm -hmm. So um, let me start with the first. I, when I write, was writing my book, I did not see any reason why he doesn't qualify to be president. If you're talking about his university education, um, you know, this is, a lot of people claim he never finished his school. He said he finished. Uh, uh, he has produced uh, documents to prove it. I don't see any reason why not to believe him. Um, what, uh, what was your second question? I'm sorry. The, oh, the coup, right. So, so I think we'll never have a complete story of the coup uh, in the mid to short term uh, for a number of reasons because um, it's not a Turkish coup. It happened under murky circumstances. Second, uh, whether or not uh, the intelligence bodies found about it on time, whether they shared that information with Erdogan. So it's, it's easy to look at how events unfolded in Turkey on that day and to believe in conspiracy theories. I don't, I think some of it is just, uh, you know, Mediterranean inefficiency. So uh, they found out about the coup. They tried to reach Erdogan. He was on summer vacation. If, Tur if Turkish president is taking a nap, you don't wake him up. <laughs> All right. So uh, I think maybe they said, oh, you know, I'm sure the intelligence bodies get rumors like this twice a year, three times a year, four times a year. It's quite often. They probably wanted to verify it before they went to him. So there's a lot of reasons why there were lapses in communication. And a lot of people look at this and say, you know, what is the real story here? I think the real story is that there was a, um, a coup attempt against him and against the rest of the military, and it failed. That's it. It failed because it was a factional business, which means that it had to be perfectly run, and everything had to go uh, excellent. If something goes wrong, everything comes off, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, you had three questions. You had two. Let's not just do one, because there's something. Then, then the rest for the end, Ooh. maybe. And at the yeah. end, yes. Uh, okay, uh, I'm Peter Damon. Uh, I uh, like very much your analysis uh, of uh, Turkish politics. Thank you very much. And in particular, the list of all the uh, groups of opponents, but I missed one that, at least in the uh, Erdogan propaganda, is extremely important, and that's uh, Fethullah Gulen and his uh, Hizmet movement, who are accused of being the uh, instigators of this failed coup. And also, I think that uh, they have now been. Um, persecuted and a disproportionate number of their uh, followers are in jail or otherwise uh, persecuted or discriminated. I would like to hear your opinion about how likely is it that the Gulen movement uh, was behind this coup and how do you see uh, the, uh, the accusation of there being some kind of parallel state of Gulenists who want to take over the whole of Turkish uh, state and society. Right, I'll be happy to, uh, sure. So uh, in the last decade, when Erdogan uh, gradually sliced Turkey's democratic institutions like Döner Kebab, remember? Very thin slices. The Gulen movement was completely part of that effort. They helped him for about a decade uh, to slice Turkey's democracy, slicing like Döner Kebab. And, they had a significant presence of their followers in uh, uh, the police, judiciary, and media. And these helped Erdogan build up a court case alleging that there was a coup plot against him called Ergenekon, collectively. Uh, there were a number of cases. I'm just referring to all of them together. It, uh, this alleged that there was a coup plot. Uh, there were military and secularists in it. The prosecutors could never pr provide a full and convincing account of this coup. They said it's so well hidden, we can't find it. And they said, the Turkish military has a history of doing coups, so believe us. A lot of people believe them. They said, Turkish military has done coups. Uh, prosecutors are saying there is a coup. We should believe it. And there's some evidence, perhaps. Uh, the Gulen movement was part of that. Uh, they helped Erdogan bring down the secularist military, as well as him uh, consolidate power. Uh, he has, for example, the right now to appoint a uh, majority of judges to the high courts without a confirmation process. That was a right given to him by a referendum in 2010 in which the Gulen movement supported him 110%. So I think they're completely on board, uh, they were completely on board with him. What happened, I think, is the following. They're, they're allies. They bring down Turkey's secular institutions together. And then I think uh, what they both wanted Turkey for themselves after that. And in my view, what ensued was a raw power struggle. 
uh, because they both wanted to control power, not share it anymore. Uh, and then since then, I think Turkey has seen many episodes of uh, this conflict between Erdogan and Gulen, a political conflict. Uh, at least in Washington, there's a consensus among analysts that officers aligned with the Gulen movement played a significant role in the coup, but there were others as well. Um, and uh, that ish struggle still continues because I think Erdogan has rightly and justifiably gone after coup plotters, uh, including members of the Gulen movement, but he's also used this to go some others as well. And I think the problem is, of course, um, a coup is secret if 500 people know about it. If 5,000 people know about it, it's not secret anymore. 50,000 people know about it, it's of course not a secret. He has arrested 50,000 people, so clearly, Many of these people had no idea what was going on, although they might or may not be members of the Gulen movement. So I'm not saying that uh, uh, every arrest made is justified or unjustified. It's just that if they are arresting coup plotters, this has to be a smaller group because you can't keep a coup secret if more than a few hundred people know about it. But clearly, I think this has become a, uh, a tool of, of course, uh, increased uh, authoritarian control by the government. But here's why I, I think the Erdogan-Gulen relationship is important. Uh, I think it's Hannah Arendt. She says there's something called uh, narcissism of differences, which means that the more similar two people or entities are, the more you hate each other when you have a fight. That's Erdogan and Gulen. They were so similar, uh, complete allies, that they despise each other now. And I think uh, Erdogan sees Gulen as an eternal enemy, different than everybody else he opposes. And it's probably not different than Gulen's view of Erdogan. And I think. That's going to be a political struggle you, you'll hear a lot about here in the U.S. and in Turkey because, as you know, Gulen lives uh, in the U.S. Okay. I would like, yes, later on we will we'll do more questions. But first, now, so I'll remember that you have questions. I would like to invite Gulsha Erçetin. Please welcome her. Yeah. That's good because I need a break, so... Nice. Sorry, need sorry, you I need said, a break. It's good, I need a break. Yeah. So. You can, make you can rest, you yeah. can take a nap. Um, Gülşah, as I said, you work at the NOS, at yes. the Foreign Desk. You go uh, to Turkey regularly to, to work with the correspondent over there. Yes. And you brought a clip yeah. of how that sometimes goes. goes, how difficult it can be. Let's, let's have a look. Na het vrijdaggebed vangen we ook bot bij de aanhangers van Erdogan. Volgens de mensen hier is het buitenland de schuld van alle problemen. En zijn wij van de buitenlandse pers er alleen maar op uit premier Erdogan zwart te maken. We need to translate it a, a little bit. <laughs> They said, go to your own country, shame on you, go to your own country, that was repeated all the time. Yeah. Uh, you're here only to to uh, make Erdogan look bad. Yes. That that kind of thing. When when was this? Well, this was after a year after Gezi. It was in 2014. So uh, and in that time, you were hearing Erdogan saying a lot that uh, the West was out to get Turkey to damage Turkey. And I've been to Turkey many many times. I live there. And I've been to several neighborhoods. I never experienced this. Uh, we went to mosques, so we had never had any problems. But this was the first time I was quite intimidated because it was like 80 Turkish men surrounding us. You, you didn't look afraid, you well, almost, but you were. Well, I, I, was, can, I was intimidated. I Actually, imagine. the re reporter yes. from News Hour, Jan Eikelboom, wasn't. But I, I was hearing what they were I were, and he couldn't speak Turkish. I was hearing what you they were, were saying. Yeah. They were ready to hit him. <laughs> so, uh, and then later on, we went. Uh, we they escorted us to the camp. So, 
that we didn't show. And the cab driver was also from that neighborhood, and he said, you were lucky you weren't CNN, because they wouldn't have let you go at that time. So, so it was quite scary, I think, yeah. yes. Yeah. People yeah. were laughing a little bit, because it's so extreme, right? Yeah. It's yeah, really, it there were so yeah. many people, and they kept on, but it must, <laughs> must have been really intimidating. How do you look at this, uh, this clip? Well, I think it shows a change in environment yeah. after the coup, I, as I said, it seems to me that uh, Turkey. But this was before. This was before. It's before. 2014. Yeah. 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 You you'd imagine. I would imagine. Be, this yeah. To be right. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it was. It was. I think it started after Gizi. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw the dynamic change, especially on the street. As a journalist, when you were filming there, our correspondent gets. <laughs> You know, the police would come up to you. Do you have a press card? Why are you filming here? Why are you here? In the past, it didn't. Before 2011, I I, I didn't see that. I didn't yeah. experience that at the same places we went to. Yeah. So it changed. Yeah. So I would say that uh, the rallies of Gezi Park in 2013 um, represent a shift, seesaw shift, and the way Erdogan looks at opposition. Until, until that moment, I think he was mostly uh, comfortable um, uh, with the broader opposition idea, and, uh, it, and his, the way he treats it has changed. Why? I see a lot of um, the way Erdogan looks at protest movements in Gezi Park uh, because of the way he looks at what happened to uh, Morsi in Egypt, who was ousted by a popular movement in which the military played a role. And I think that remains Erdogan's uh, fear, that any protest movement could spin out of control, could oust him from power. So, and there's a similarity. Uh, Morsi's movement is an Islamist movement. Erdogan's movement has roots in Islamism. So uh, he sees this maybe perhaps similar trajectories that he wants to avoid. So I think what happened to Morsi uh, maybe has shifted Erdogan's view of uh, you know, uh, uh, protest and uh, opposition forever. Yeah. that he fears that if he wants to avoid Morsi's uh, fate, he should never allow uh, things that ousted Morsi ever grow to that proportions. So that's probably one reason why the crackdown on Gezi was so fierce, because it followed... Yeah, this example. Yeah, it follows how, the how Egyptian example. We, we don't see... From his point of view. We don't compare countries enough. I think uh, there's a lot of lessons that he drew from what happened in Egypt. Uh, you had an Islamist party which came to power democratically. It was ousted by a popular movement in which the military played a role. So every time there's a popular movement, he fears that it could result in his ouster and therefore is increasingly not tolerant of that. Yeah. This was the starting point. Of, um, how difficult is it now to work there? To interview people, do people even dare to be interviewed? Well, it's difficult. Our correspondent, Lucas Wagmeister, he um, he tells me that it's really difficult sometimes to get people on camera talking about certain subjects in Turkey. So they were afraid of the consequences. So it's really hard to convince them to do an interview. But also, uh, right before the referendum, he made an uh, he made an interesting item. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but it was in the city of Kayseri, and he was interviewing someone from the biggest opposition party, the CHP, and he was literally followed by the police for two days, and they were filming his interview, and you can see that uh, while watching uh, his report that they were filming the, the guy he was interviewing and uh, Lucas. So that was quite intimidating as well because the guy... And they did it in plain view, like as a warning. Yes, yeah, they yeah. were right there. Yeah. <laughs> and the person who was interviewed, uh, yeah, he, 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 you could see by the look at his face that he was intimidated. So the answers were also not... I love Erdogan, yeah. Like, oh, yeah no, 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 not yeah. that, but you could you could see that he was intimidated yeah. so he was watching his words while speaking yeah. there's a lot of talk about the long arm of erdogan how his power reaches to the netherlands to germany do you get intimidations working in that in the Netherlands as well? Is it difficult sometimes? Well, to it's do your job in here? Holland it is more um, that that you that the people you can never do it right in Holland. I experienced that if you say something about Turkey, there's always a group that will say something. It's 
so nobody's satisfied. That's very, really challenging. So uh, the polarization there is actually right visible here as well. And then do you mean the, the Turkish Dutch? Yeah, the Dutch yeah. Turks. Yeah, the Turks yeah. living yeah. in Holland. So yeah. yes, so uh, they're also very divided, I think. But uh, it has, it didn't happen to me that I was like approached on the streets or uh, no, that didn't happen. But you can, feel, you can, you know, they are really emotional. That's what I see. Yeah. 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 So, but people don't hold it against you that you have a Turkish background. They feel that you have to. I don't know. Yeah. If you read my Facebook comments and Twitter comments, yeah, I cannot. I don't think it's the right place to to read to you what they're saying. So, but yeah, I'm constantly confronted with my background, uh, the Dutch Turks, some of them who are angry at me, and I'm. I'm a news editor at the Foreign Desk. I speciali specialize in Turkey. I mean, I live quite an anonymous life, and still, there, you know, they know a way to find. They find a way to find me. So, yeah, it's um, it's sometimes intimidating as well what they write about you. You so. read it. You always read it. Yeah, I always read it, and it's funny because they. It's funny that they totally don't agree with each other, but they agree about the NOS that they're doing something wrong. So it's quite funny sometimes, yeah. Do, do you get that, that people react and, yeah? Um, mine so, is a different story because yeah, I live in the, the States, US and there's a very small Turkish American yeah. community and it's very dispersed and... Um, and the long arm doesn't reach all the way across the No, I think it's a very different experience, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, not so, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think also there's a long arm going the other way around. I think a lot of Turks living in Holland uh, watch Turkey very closely. They watch Turkish television. They read Turkish newspapers. They're they're really into Turkey, and uh, so they also the arm goes also I think the other way around, yeah. Yeah. reaching to Turkey. And uh, what we see right now in Turkey, I think, is that we have first a leader in Turkey who who uses uh, to who uses his his position to approach the Turks in Europe we've never saw uh, seen that before here in Europe yeah. I mean he's uh, sonar said it he's been 15 years in power and he's I think the first leader in Turkey who approaches the Turks here living here calling calling them their ambassador you're my ambassadors he says and uh, he says you're uh, he always he did this in Germany a couple of years ago where he said, do integrate, but don't assimilate. So I think, and, and he knows that he, there's a lot of voting potential in Europe for him. And he and makes- In the referendum, it was important, right? Yes, the, and the, he uses that. So we're seeing for the first time a leader in Turkey really <coughs> calling for, for the Turks in Europe, like reaching just, out to yeah. them. Let me yeah, just yeah. comment, uh, not on your experience, because I can't even uh, imagine that I could relate to it. Uh, I don't live here. But I think there are, demographically speaking, uh, two important facts. One is, remember I showed you numbers, Erdogan's majority is very thin, 1%, and it will get smaller because the gr uh, people are growing up under him, are turning against him in bigger numbers. So every vote counts in 2019, and there are two groups that he will cultivate. One of, uh, is uh, European Turks, because they tend to be disproportionately more conservative, he knows that and more pro-AKP and more pro-Erdogan, so I think he's going to rally more here before 2019. Just because of numbers, you have, uh, you know, five, five million or so European Turks, let's say two million of them vote, uh, that is 4% in Turkey, if you get two million people to vote. That's pretty significant. The voting uh, rate here is not very high. In Turkey, turnout is 80%, 85 Here it's just about 50 Maybe he'll try to push that up, right? So. That's a big number. Turkey has 50, uh, 80 million people, 58 million voters. Uh, if 85% vote, that means you got nearly 55 million, 50 million voters. So that's 500,000 is 1%. Uh, Turks in Netherlands make up nearly 1%. That's a big number. Um, so that's one constituency. Do you think yeah. that, that the, the Dutch should prevent is rallying yeah. in our country. Of the so I think it, it could backfire, which is what, what happened in the recent yeah. referendum, yeah. because yeah. then, of course, he used it to mobilize his base that Turks were not being recognized of their rights and freedoms here, to freedom of expression. It's a political rally. There's nothing wrong about it. 
I think it did backfire. It helped him. Uh, it didn't help him win the referendum, but it added to his victory. And so I think in 2019, that's going to be part of his strategy. It, every vote counts, and uh, the European Turks are significant. And then there's an issue of Syrian refugees uh, in Turkey, nearly 3 million. Uh, so Turkish laws say that if you lived in Turkey more than five years, you can petition for citizenship. Syrian refugees started coming in 2012. There's 3 million of them. The majority of them came in 2014, five years, 2019. So many of them will be petitioning for citizenship around that time. Uh, all of them will be pro Erdogan because he saved their life. It's, it's logical. He, he, he basically gave them a second life, and they're grateful to him for rightful reasons. And so I think that's going to be a big debate in Turkey uh, because granting them citizenship will flip they might flip the vote for him, and it's going to be a big divisive uh, issue. And, but he will probably move ahead with it, because legally speaking, they do qualify for citizenship, and there's no barriers against that. Yeah. Gülşe, you brought another clip. It's yeah. excerpts of a speech of Erdogan, and we see a crowd. We see a crowd. It's, we're not seeing him, but I, I wanted to show what he's saying what? here, because yeah. it's typical what we see from him, uh, especially the, the couple of, last couple of months. So. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look. Onlar bana diktatör demiş, bilmem şunu demiş, bunu demiş filan hiç umurumda değil. Bir kulağımdan girer, öbür kulağımdan çıkar. Milletim ne diyor? Önemli olan bu. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you look at this, if you see this? Yeah, I, yeah. I think it's um, basically him speaking to that 50% that adores him, <laughs> saying there's nothing wrong. Uh, don't believe the picture they're uh, painting. Uh, you do live in a free society, and, uh, and they do. I think that the half of Turkey that adores Erdogan and supports him uh, has complete rights and freedoms. And I think they see, of course, nothing wrong with the picture. It's the uh, bifurcation of Turkey into two halves that uh, worries me. Yeah. Because increasingly there's little empathy between the experience of one versus the other. So I, I, I've been seeing this a lot um, on social media about how uh, conservative Turks pro Erdogan uh, are talking about a time when they were treated second class. And they're saying that therefore what they're doing is justifiable. Of course, two wrongs don't make a right. But I think that rhetoric is still there, uh, that they're seeing this as kind of revenge time, uh, payback. and. Uh, countries, of course, don't function like that. I think you have to ultimately stop doing that and agree that you have to move forward. And I, uh, I think one of the reasons why I am um, optimistic about Turkey is because um, the two halves are equally large, of course, demographically and economically. You could argue that the anti-Erdogan half is more powerful. I showed you a map which said 73% of the GDP is in the provinces that voted against him. And despite Erdogan's effort to create a crony class of capitalists, the country's majority wealth is still in the hands of secular pro-Western European businesses. So clearly, these are two very big blocks. And the nice thing is, uh, it's not like you have 10% here and 90% there. So the 90% can tell the 10% get off. It's, it's 50 and 50. So they have to learn to live together. Uh, the future goes through recognizing that both sides are equally uh, great citizens. They have a place in this country. Because neither side can wish the other side away. It's not possible demographically, economically, or by the sheer fact that they're such big blocks. So that gives me hope that it, Turkey will find some kind of modus vivendi around the fact that it's uh, these two very big countervailing blocks, and one cannot wish the other one will disappear. Gosha, how do you look at that? What do you think if you, if you have to predict uh, Turkish? Future. Well, one thing I learned, uh, you never can predict what's going on in Turkey. Uh, I follow Turkey now for more than 10 years, so it's sometimes it still surprises me. Um, but I agree with Sonar that uh, that's what I found so fascinating. It's on who you ask that question to. And he, you said it really, really well, the people who vote for him they say everything's great in Turkey. And the other, the people who didn't vote for him, they, they're really scared and uh, they don't see the, they see a, not a good future for Turkey. Let's call it that it, way. It's as if it's two different worlds. Yes, because uh, sometimes he's also the president of the people who didn't vote for him, you know? 
yeah. and they don't experience that. So he's a good president to the people who voted for him. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only way forward is a new social consensus where the two blocks agree to live and let live and recognize that if they don't, the other side is not going to disappear. Yeah. You're also here to advise uh, our foreign uh, ministry. What, what do you, on their politics uh, towards Turkey, what, what is your advice? Um, that's off the record. Oh, is this a, is this a <laughs> yeah, but I can tell you that. Um, um, we won't tell anyone. Yeah, of course. Chat him out. So let me scan the room so I know everybody here. I'll find you. I was trained as a sniper. I really was, so. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I got everybody. No, first so. the yoga, yeah. then the sniper. <laughs> yeah. and, oh, another time. Yeah. So um, um, I think the biggest concern, and this is uh, not just here. I was in London. I did briefings for the Foreign Office, and I'm going to continue on a book tour in Europe, going to Italy. Um, Spain, uh, Copenhagen, uh, Paris, and I'm getting similar questions. It's all about Turkey's uh, belonging to the Western family of nations, EU and NATO. Uh, of course, the biggest concern is what to do with EU accession. And in Washington, the debate is NATO. Um, I think uh, news on the EU side are not very good. Uh, Erdogan does not feel the need uh, to make Turkey a European country. I think uh, you've heard my take that I think he was utilitarian on that process. He, he used the EU accession to get rid of the military, and then he forgot about the EU accession. And, and EU allowed him to forget about it because uh, they were mesmerized by Erdogan's rhetoric of getting rid of the deep state, uh, the nefarious coup plotters, that they kind of forgot that uh, while he was doing that, of course, it wasn't becoming a more liberal society. Uh, one of the reasons why I was one of the earliest uh, kind of uh, critics uh, on this issue uh, was that I, you know, I, I was tracking some of these developments, and I. I do give him credit. I think Turkey's record on rights and liberties improved during the first Erdogan government. By every indicator, Turkey became a more free, more equal place between 2002 and 7. Then it plateaued after 2007. It stopped improving. It just stayed where it is. And then after 2011, his third electoral victory, where he got 49%, nearly half, it started going down gender equality, uh, media freedom by every indicator. So you can kind of look at it, uh, also put it into my book, there are charts where you can see how the more popular he becomes, the, more, the less free Turkey becomes. And uh, so the question I think was always that uh, the used leverage was stronger in the first part of his uh, government. Uh, when, as I said, I, so that I, doesn't really help now. It doesn't, doesn't really help, help, but it's a question I think Europe has to answer. My suggestion is, uh, uh, I think Erdogan wants the EU to end accession talks, and it should be Erdogan who ends talks and not the EU. Here's why. Uh, if the decision is made by the Europeans, uh, this is basically Erdogan turning to all Turks and saying, they there's no room to. for you in Europe because you're Muslims, and uh, you know, are you convinced now? Everybody's going to say, yes, we are convinced now, because you can make the counter argument. So it has to be uh, sane. Uh, I think that Europe, Europe and Turkey, Europe Turkey relationship, I think, is full of love and hate. So it's a lot of history uh, going back hundreds of years, and we all learn about it in school. And you're you're supposed to unlearn it, but I think what you learn stays with you. And and of course, part of that is that you the relationship is sometimes viewed emotionally, which in the U.S. is never the case because Turkey-U.S. relationship doesn't have that kind of history. Um, and so because of that emotionality, I think people look at uh, Turkey differently and they, of course, everything Turkey does upsets people. Everything Europe does upsets Turks. So maybe the rational thing is to look at the accession process very mechanically mm -hmm. and to see who would gain and who would lose if the accession talks ended. I'd be strongly against it. I think it would be a very bad decision okay. to end the talks. Uh, it would empower Erdogan thinking, not him, but his thinking inside Turkey that, uh, that you know, what Turks have as a religion is not compatible with Europe and its values, and therefore they should separate, go separate paths, although they can deal with each other economically. Yeah. Yeah. Gosha, you wanted to react. Yeah, yeah because uh, the Turks are trying for so many years to get into the EU, and uh, Sonar said something, also Turks who, who like or hate Erdogan, it's, I think it's in general that they, they gave up. So the, uh, the polls say right now that they don't even want to join anymore. And uh, we did a lot of stories about Turkey and the EU in Turkey. And the answers we always get were, was, was Erdogan, uh, is what was Erdogan was saying. Uh, like Romania is a member, Bulgaria is a member, why can't we uh, be a member? 
it's not fair, that story, we heard that a lot in Turkey. And um, also, uh, it shifted. When you watch Erdogan in the beginning, in 2004, we talked about this earlier, I mean, he got elected European of the Year by uh, uh, the magazine European Voice. And he was praised for what he was doing in Turkey. Every journalist we interviewed, or I interviewed at the time when I was working in Turkey, was uh, applauding Erdogan. The, the same journalists who are now in jail or criticizing Erdogan. So that shift is 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 really the tr yeah the transformation yeah. 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 Let's go to questions, but I'm going to be tough now. You really can only <coughs> ask one question. Thank you very much. Um, I was going to ask you uh, what perspective you saw for Turkey to become a sta more stable and strong uh, country again. But uh, my other question, I think... No, 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 no. no. It was one question. This was your question. Sorry. That's not your question? Okay. I don't ask that question because I'm... I answered it. ...worried. I just mentioned it. But, uh, because it, I find it very important to know. But um, my concern is a bit about what book, I so. read on your uh, site, your website. And maybe people haven't read it, so I just read it loud. The mission of the Washington Institute uh, seeks to... Uh, sorry. That can you. <laughs> what, but can you make the point, maybe? Um, no, seeks to advance a, a balanced and realistic understanding of American interests in the Middle East and to promote the policies that secure them. And honestly, if I look at the American interest, uh, um, President Trump says it loud and clear, we should be the strongest, we should be the he have the hegemony on the world, and he shows it. I think the other, looking backward now, I'm afraid all the other presidents thought the same, even Obama. But yeah, my point is, um, how can, I be sure that your in institute is objective about Turkey. And what I hear from there, uh, here and there, from, tu in, from Turks in Turkey, um, then I, I'm concerned about the American, um, uh, sorry, the interests. I wouldn't like, and I think nobody of us would like, the way America sees her interests in Afghanistan, Iraq, Middle East, um, to have them here in Holland in that way. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so I think there's, there's a difference between U.S. government, uh, different the U.S. government and American. I don't work for the U.S. government. I don't represent its views. Uh, uh, I represent views of the country I live in, and I also come from other country, which I think I know and studied and have that written a PhD dissertation on, and I rely on that for my analysis. And I like to think that it's um, thought-provoking, uh, critical, and as well as informative. Um, so if you read my book and you conclude that it's not, you can email me and we can chat. <laughs> okay, new rules. Short questions. Don't ask the questions you don't want to ask. And you're the first with a new rule. That's a lot of pressure. So <clears throat> Turkey is a historically Pol uh, polarized country, and you agreed to that. You said that over and over. Now, my question is, how has that changed since Erdogan's power? Because to me, it seems like it's just the balance of power shifting, those couple of percent moving backward and forward. And you seemed very uh, optimistic about this polarization going forward. My question is, do you think that's really the case that it's going to improve, or will it be another story of just those percent moving to the other side and the other side doing kind of roughly the same? So uh, my issue I raise is not that it's uh, polarized and this is unique. Uh, I think most, a lot of societies have polarization, uh, many of them, and the issue is whether uh, you can deal with your problems democratically whether you have democratic paths and avenues open. And increasingly in Turkey, that's not the case because uh, rights and liberties of those who oppose Erdogan are being suspended. Uh, there's a state of emergency that was put in place after the coup. Uh, it's, it's been going on for a year and it has just been extended again. Erdogan said it will be extended until there's 
peace and welfare in Turkey? How do you measure peace and welfare? So that's what makes it different, that it's not, that it's polarized, that it's a polarized society in which you have also polarization around the vision of this person. I call it the Ataturk vision, where half like it and the half will never fall under it, and the half that falls doesn't want to fall under it increasingly thinks that they cannot oppose it democratically. That's what's dangerous. It's in Erdogan's interest to keep Turkey democratic so that people who oppose him feel that they can vent their frustration and express their disappointment with the system and work inside the system to change it and, and not outside of it. Uh, as I'm, I'm sort of torn about where it can go. Um, I don't want to give you the end of the book because I want you to buy it. Uh, but um, <laughs> it's like I can't tell you the end of a movie. It's a spoiler. Um, but I, I think that it, there's a very good chance uh, that, as I said, this will work out because of the fact that the two blocks are equally large. And that's actually not a bad thing, maybe, uh, so long as it remains a democracy, because then they will have to learn to have a modus vivendi. Uh, but I'm worried because there are uh, many nefarious outside actors, uh, especially Russia, which actually wants to use this polarization to turn it into this low-level conflict uh, where Russians are known to have uh, links to many groups in Turkey, including the PKK. It was established with Soviet support in the Cold War in Syrian occupied uh, Lebanese Bekaa Valley. Uh, so uh, I think the Russians have deep historic ties with them from the uh, communism years. And so it's easy for them to restore and re re reawaken those ties in an effort to undermine Erdogan and Turkey's stability. So a lot, I think, has to be seen with what Turkey's neighbors will do. And right now, Turkey doesn't have a lot of neighbors that like Erdogan. Uh, that's a big problem. Uh, a lot of it has got to do with the foreign policy, especially involvement in Syria. Yes. I'm going to give you the mic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I have a kind of a specific question because I write about uh, LGBT rights for vice, and um, I had a question about uh, minority rights in Turkey because I read a lot of contradictions about the LGBT minority. Uh, on the one hand, I read in the media a lot when they talk about Erdogan that he's not protecting minority rights and uh, freedom of speech. But on the other hand, I also see Erdogan uh, with the most famous diva on the picture, which is actually a transgender person. <laughs> so, um, yeah, my question is actually like, what, what do you think is his uh, mentality about the LGBT community in Turkey? So I think that since the coup, uh, the political culture in Turkey has shifted and become more outwardly conservative. Uh, and that's because Erdogan uh, knows that it was a hard conservative base which basically put their lives out in front of the tanks to stop the coup. And he appreciates that base and wants to nurture it. And so there's this, um, he's not only become less of a gradualist since the coup in terms of power consolidation, but more of a uh, arch conservative in social policies. And I think that also reflects into LGBT rights. So Turkey has had a pride parade for nearly 20 years. This last year was the first time it was banned by the government and it didn't take place. So I think there's a clear statement. I just, hi, I just have a very quick question uh, regarding, uh, do you know the exact percentage of European um, Turks supporting Erdogan? So do you have recent statistics on that? Like what percentage? Sure. So, um, so yeah. uh, the turnout in the election among European Turks was just over 50%, 53%. Uh, in Turkey, that was 86%. So half of the European Turks do not vote, first of all. So we don't know who they support, right? Because they don't vote. Those who vote yeah. uh, supported in larger numbers Erdogan than compared to Turks in your, uh, back in Turkey. So in Turkey, Erdogan won the referendum by 51%. Uh, in most European countries, uh, including here, uh, Germany, Belgium, Austria, Denmark, yeah. That was over 60% support for him. We have numbers, right? Yeah. Do you know the demographics for that? Like what age group? Sorry. Oh, I don't have the breakdown. I'm sorry. Yeah, but I think this is useful. So I, have, I speak English and German. Let's see if I can figure this out. <laughs> right. So the except, uh, yeah. So of course, uh, you're seeing uh, is the US here, for Anik Staten, or yeah. is that? Yeah, so it's uh, voters who say yes, then it's the, the right. amount of voters, it's the uh, no mm -hmm. voters, and the amount, but more, more no, yeah. More no voters, and the... 
right. amount. So this is, of course, half of the European Turks, because the other half didn't vote. We don't know what they want. But those who voted are voting in larger numbers. Uh, let's take Germany and France, Netherlands, Austria, Belgium. There are 60 to 70 percent, higher, much higher than uh, you would see in Turkey. I think that's related to the fact that, uh, that you guys know this. Uh, the Turkish diaspora in Europe is mostly from the traditionally conservative parts of Turkey in the center and east. So it's naturally more conservative because in Turkey those groups are also conservative to begin with. Yes. Uh, I have a question about the foreign uh, policy of the Turkey. Uh, you said uh, Russia, uh, Iran, Syria are in a coalition against uh, uh, Turkey, but Turkey is now buying S-400 uh, missiles from uh, Russia. I think it's about because of uh, uh, America is sending weapons to the uh, IPG. What do you think about that? Uh, what do you think about that? So uh, I think um, I'm getting tired, so we will end up. Um, uh, Erdogan uh, is uh, worried about a number of issues in the relationship with the U.S. One is uh, U.S. support to YPG, which you know is linked to the PKK, which Turkey is fighting. Uh, it's a terrorist group. It's very upsetting, not just to Erdogan, but to many Turks, that there's a close relationship between Washington and a Kurdish group uh, that is considered a terrorist group, including by NATO. And there are many other issues, including a recent indictment against an economy minister uh, in the U.S. for violating Iran-related sanctions. So I think Turkey now it wants to use leverage so that the U.S. will uh, shift its policy on some of those issues. And I see the S-400 decision more along those lines. Uh, I think no, none of these big deals are final until they're final. Turkey signed a similar deal with the Chinese uh, four years ago to buy Chinese air defense systems. And it created a big backlash in NATO. And then Turkey came down the ladder again. And I would not be surprised if this is another of those cases, I think, where uh, he decides to come down the ladder once he gets the kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, deal that he wants from Washington. So I think you'll have to kind of watch the uh, trajectory of the relationship going forward. Let's say any more questions, you can find the answers in your book. Yes, thank you. You can buy it online. Uh, there are flyers if you can't, it was on your seat, if you can't find it, there are more. One more question. Okay. Why on earth did you want to be a sniper? <laughs> I was joking. No, no, no. Oh, you yeah. thought you said it. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad we 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 we, we discovered that uh, that you were. It was just to scare people. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> it worked. So now everybody's gonna remember that. Thank you very much, right. Sonar Gusha. Yeah, thank you very thank you. much for being here. Thank you.